So we are in the midst of exploring dukkha. Not a pleasant topic, but a pretty important one. Uh, perhaps for many of us, this is important because Buddha said, all that I have taught and everything I teach is dukkha and the end of dukkha. Imagine that all his teachings, all his maps, all his meditative practices, all led him to this one important conclusion. And for every single one of us, this is a topic that is so important because we relate to it. After all, we live with dukkha and experience it all the time, every day, moment after moment, in ways that are big and small, ordinary and extraordinary. It is helpful to remember that there is no exact English translation for this term. It has been referred to as suffering, stress, dissatisfactoriness, dis-ease, misery, anxiety, grieving, loss, irritation, resentment, and physical pain. Dukkha is all this and more. I have found some that translate dukkha as reactivity. And although this may not be the most accurate translation of dukkha, it is certainly the most accurate descriptor. We experience something we don't like, and we react by any and every attempt to turn away from, remove, fix, change, etc. Or we experience something that we do like, and our attachment reactivity kicks in, and we attempt to grasp and to hold and to retain and to keep and to own. And invariably, we find that what is meant to be here will stay, and what is not meant to be here any longer will not. So our unsuccessful reactivity generates some form of suffering, discomfort, stress, suffering, whatever. Why is this so? Because nothing is permanent. No experiential subjective state, none whatsoever are permanent. This points to another of the three characteristics of existence, a Nietzsche, impermanence. To repeat some of Buddha's final words, all phenomena are impermanent. Our ignorant conditioned mind that makes us reactively chase for eternal happiness through things that are ephemeral and temporary is the cause and experience of our dukkha. And dukkha is not a description of what simply happens to us. It actually happens with us. Dukkha happens with us and the cessation or the end of dukkha also happens with us. Dukkha happens with us because of the third and final of the three characteristics, anatta, not self. The experience that we have of being an autonomous and permanent I, me and mine. Of course, it's not that these don't exist and function in an ordinary sense, we, we need them to. It's just that none of these I, me's, and mine's function independently or permanently or without cause. Our ignorance and the cultivation of seeing through this ignorance is the ultimate aim of this wonderful practice that we cultivate, which we call insight meditation or Vipassana. As the great philosopher Nagarjuna said, what is inside is me, what is outside is mine, when these thoughts end, freedom reigns. Hence, we can appreciate that contemplating and understanding any one of the three characteristics of our existence invariably leads to the other two. They are interdependent. Each characteristic sheds light on the other two. As long as we live, we will experience ordinary conditioned thoughts and identifications of I, me, and mine. And we will continue to experience the reality of impermanence. But to the extent that we see them for what they are and what they aren't, we can free ourselves from dukkha. 
the popular expression in life, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional, can be understood in this particular way. Pain as the circumstantial experiences that we have, they are the first or initial arrow, meaning all that is unpleasant or painful, that life, fate, or circumstance shoots at us. And the second arrow, that which we shoot at ourselves, this is our reactivity. We understand that our experiences of suffering or all the other dukkha terms are referring to this second arrow of reactivity. Understanding this, not just conceptually and intellectually, but through our direct embodied experience of seeing, which we cultivate by our insight practice, this is right view. One of the two paths in the wisdom section of the Eightfold Path. Just last night, I was getting ready to go to bed and I grabbed the tissue and half a cup of water that were sitting by my nightstand. I walked them to the bathroom with the intention of throwing away the tissue in the garbage and spilling the cup of water out into the sink. My fatigue and distractibility took over and I found myself spilling the water into the garbage can. It was as if I was moving in slow motion. I am looking at this water being mistakenly spilled in the garbage and my brain immediately says, oh shit, and then I start laughing at the absurdity of this behavior. It was in the not so distant past that my brain wouldn't have been laughing at all and instead would have been berating me for my stupidity, annoyed with myself, and then annoyed with becoming annoyed. The difference between the first arrow of circumstance and experience and the second arrow of reactivity and the difference between the conditioned, ignorant, reactive mind of dukkha and the more relaxed, softer, and wiser heart mind of mindful awareness. It is good and helpful to know that we are not saying that the goal is to eliminate all of our pleasures or that pleasure experiences are inherently bad. It is our relationship to pleasure experiences, which is wholesome, or unwholesome. People often have difficulty with understanding dukkha with pleasant experiences. How might love or joy, for example, be dukkha? We must understand that dukkha is not suffering in the way we often use the word suffering in English. Rather, dukkha here is the simple fact that these experiences do not create an ultimate freedom. Because everything is impermanent, all experiences will eventually end. When the joy leaves us, we may suffer. The point is that it is transient. It is not a cause of lasting sukha. But this doesn't mean we should avoid or be aversive to pleasant or joy experiences. And there are indeed pleasure or happiness sukha experiences, which are intrinsically wholesome. These include the happiness of virtuous conduct, the lovely experience of feeling good simply because we're living to the best of our abilities in alignment with what are humanly wholesome qualities and ways of living and in accordance with our values. There's also the happiness of a mind temporarily free of afflictive emotions, samadhi, a state of mind that we can cultivate and strengthen through concentration practices. And there is the happiness of liberation. Buddha called this unshakable peace of mind the highest happiness. This is what we are aspiring to. And even though we may never fully get there, we can most definitely experience less dukkha less frequent dukkha for smaller durations and more frequent increasing amounts of remembering of true seeing. So how do we practice with dukkha? Bill and Susan have given us many perspectives and handholds for this. I'd like to suggest one off the cushion practice, 
well, but with an important caveat, and then one on the cushion handhold. Choose one ordinary pleasure. It may be the sipping of a morning cup of coffee or the pleasurable feeling when one first climbs into bed at the end of a long day. You choose something. Bring your attention to the sensations of this experience. Notice the thoughts. See if you can notice thought, emotion, and sensation reactivity. Or wanting pleasant or pleasurable to last. Does it? Of course we know it really doesn't. But what's it like to know this experientially in the body? And what's it like for you as sensations shift, change, and fade away? The caveat is that we, we appreciate that as we practice this noticing and awareness, we are not eliminating joy from our lives. We are attending more closely to pleasure experiences, and we are refining our perceptual intelligence. There is joy to be had in this refinement. And in the efforts that we expend towards this, this is wholesome joy. This is sukha. And on the cushion, we are all familiar with the frequent visitors that inevitably arrive for us all, popularly known as the hindrances. Sensory desire, aversion, restlessness, tiredness or heaviness, and the doubting mind. What would formal sitting practice be like for us all if we never knew them as hindrances, but rather as opportunities? As stepping stones of experience that bring us closer to insight and clear seeing one moment at a time. Opportunities to bring our dukkha, our reactivity under the examination of the most important microscope that we possess our mindful awareness. I know how helpful this shift in perspective can be for me in my own practice, a way of celebrating or valuing the challenges and the discomforts. So what's it like? What's it gonna be like when we invite dukkha in this way? What learnings are in store for us today, right here in our practice? 